Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, we begin with the rebound in markets, and we're joined by Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. Quite the bounce back in Asia overnight, Kriti. A massive bounce back. We'll start on the Japanese uh, stock market there. The top X, a whopping 9.3%. To do even better, the Nikkei 225 closing over 10% higher. This is, of course, compared to the 12% drop yesterday. So in about 24 hours, in two sessions time, you did not see a complete pairing back of, of the losses, but pretty close. Some pretty good volatility that is likely to sustain throughout the week. You're also going to see a similar story, Nathan, over in uh, the South Korean index. Remember, chips is still very much a story. So any index with exposure there, it was uh, taking a lot of the extra turmoil. Today, they are seeing extra gains. So the Kospi over in South Korea, higher by 3.3%. Kosdaq closing up over 6%. And what are we seeing as far as European trading goes, Credit. So a little bit of a mixed picture when it comes to Europe. You would think some of the positivity would kind of feed on over, and it's doing the exact opposite, actually. Uh, so when you do look at, say, the Eurostoxx 50, it's actually down by two-tenths of 1%. You're not seeing that same optimism. To be fair, you also didn't see that same drop to that extent yesterday, but still a 2% drop yesterday about on average across some of the indexes. Today, you are seeing most of these indexes about flat. The French index, however, down about half a percent, taking the biggest hit off all the major uh, indices. All right, Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, and Kriti will be checking in with you throughout the morning, of course. And as we said earlier, we are seeing a bit of a bounce back in U.S. futures following yesterday's sell-off. The S&P 500 lost 3 percent, extending a tumble from its peak to 8.5 percent. The tech-heavy Nasdaq 100 also lost 3 percent. It is now off to its worst start to a month since 2008. Lindsay Rosner is head of a multi-sector investing at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. The market is getting into a healthier zone, and markets don't don't move, even though I think we've been pretty used to it recently, in a straight line up. Uh, we have to understand that these kind of drawdowns and retracements happen. And this is why, from an active management seat where we are, we, we want to have the steady hands in the market to add where it makes sense. And Goldman Sachs Asset Management's Lindsay Rosner, Wall Street's fear gauge, the VIX, was above 65 at one point yesterday. Today, it's recouping and is around 33. And Karen, as speculation grows on whether the Federal Reserve will cut rates ahead of its September meeting, some are throwing cold water on the idea, including Bloomberg Opinion contributor Mohamed Alarian. I am of the view that this will we will look back on this and say it was an overreaction in certain parts of the markets. And the market got carried away by demanding inter-meeting cuts, by demanding 75 basis points in September. It's not going to happen. That's Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian. Well, Nathan, Fed officials are also dousing hopes of a rate cut before September. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly is indicating that cuts should begin in coming quarters. You know, from my mind, we've now confirmed that the labor market is slowing. And it's extremely important that we not let it slow so much that it tips the, the that it tips itself into a downturn. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly added she still sees the labor market as reasonably solid as most employers are not cutting jobs. Well, Karen, one of the hardest hit tech stocks during the recent sell-off was NVIDIA. It is down about 25 percent from its recent high. And we've learned NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang has been unloading shares. He sold nearly $323 million worth in July. Combined with shares sold in June, Jensen Huang has unwound almost a half billion dollars in his NVIDIA stake since the stock hit its peak amid the AI-fueled rally. Nathan investor Kathy Wood is defending her sale of NVIDIA shares before the company's huge rally. We caught up with the ARK Investment CEO. We wrote it up a hundredfold. Would we have liked another triple? Sure. But here is the most important question. For NVIDIA to be, to deserve where it is right now from a valuation point of view, other companies out there must be having phenomenal results. ARK Investment CEO Kathy Wood made the comments on the Bloomberg Tiger Money podcast. Now, Karen, to the latest on the presidential race. It is officially a race now. Vice President Kamala Harris has clinched the Democratic nomination for president. We get the very latest from Bloomberg's Steve Potisk in Washington. 
The virtual roll call vote wrapped up last night, and the Democratic National Committee says the vice president won 99% of the delegates' votes. The process was a formality. No one else was on the ballot. Now the question is who will join Harris on the ticket? She's expected to announce her running mate today. Over the weekend, she met with at least three contenders, Mark Kelly of Arizona, Pennsylvania's Josh Shapiro, and Tim Walz from Minnesota. Harris is kicking off a seven-battleground state tour this afternoon afternoon in Shapiro's home state in Philadelphia. She'll formally accept the nomination later this month at the Democratic National Convention. In Washington, Steve Podisk, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Steve, thanks. Well, back in Washington, it's going to be a very long couple of days for Boeing. The plane maker is facing its most extensive hearing yet into the fuselage blowout back in January that exposed multiple quality lapses at its factories. The National Transportation Safety Board is spreading the questioning over 20 hours today and tomorrow. Since the accident, Boeing has named a new CEO. It's agreed to buy back its supplier, Spirit Aerosystems, and it's pleaded guilty to a conspiracy charge from two previous seven. 37 max crashes. And Karen, a legal loss for Alphabet this morning. A federal judge has ruled Google illegally monopolized the search market through exclusive deals. Google made $26 billion in payments to be the default search engine on smartphones and web browsers. The judge ruled those payments effectively blocked any other competitor from succeeding in the search market. This is the government's first major antitrust victory against a tech giant in more than two decades. And it's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. And for that, we're joined by Bloomberg's John Tucker. John, good morning. And good morning, Karen. Debbie is now a killer. Downgraded from hurricane to tropical storm, it damaged homes and businesses, sent floodwaters rising, caused sweeping power outages across Florida and Georgia, and led to several fatalities. In Georgia, the mayor of Savannah issued a curfew. It's going to catch a whole lot of people by surprise. Bloomberg meteorologist Rob Carolyn is tracking the storm. John, Tropical Storm Debbie is located on the coast of Georgia this morning, and this system is going to be responsible for some very heavy rainfall over the eastern Carolinas and Georgia over the next several days. Some places are going to receive in excess of two feet of rain from this system. Bloomberg meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Several U.S. personnel were injured in a suspected rocket attack at a military base in Iraq. The attack comes as tensions across the Mideast are spiking following the killings last week of a senior Hezbollah commander in Lebanon and Hamas's top political leader in Iran. The U.S. and its allies are working to head off a wider conflict. And Bloomberg's Nancy Lyons has more from Washington. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he's been speaking with leaders from Qatar and Egypt, the two countries who've been helping lead negotiations for a ceasefire. It is a critical moment. We are engaged in intense diplomacy, um, pretty much round the clock, with a very simple message. All parties must refrain from escalation. Iran has said it wants to avoid an all-out war, but needs to create deterrence against Israel. Israel says its forces are on a hair-trigger alert to carry out defensive and offensive missions. In Washington, Nancy Lyons, Bloomberg Radio. Most New York City restaurants taking part in the city's pandemic-era outdoor dining program haven't sought permits to make their sheds permanent, meaning they'll have to be dismantled. The critics called those outdoor structures eyesores that attracted rats and took up parking spaces while proponents say they inject life into the urban landscape. Michigan voters today will decide which Republican and Democratic candidates will compete in November for the state's highly coveted open U.S. Senate seat, in addition to several of the nation's most competitive U.S. House races. Many Democrats have coalesced around Representative Alyssa Slotkin in the Senate race, while Republicans have united behind former Congressman Mike Rogers, who received an endorsement from Donald Trump earlier this year. Both candidates vying for the seat left open by longtime Democratic Senator Debbie Stabenow's retirement, but they must first defeat underdog challengers in today's voting. Global News, 24 hours a day. And whatever you wanted with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker. This is Bloomberg. Nathan and Karen. All right, John. Thank you. Time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashauer. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. It was already going to be a long road trip for the Mets with games in Anaheim, Denver, Seattle. Then they had a rain out in St. Louis. Had to make it up yesterday. They stopped in, got great pitching from Sean Manaya, broke the game open in the fifth inning. Is 1-2. 
Line down the right field line. That's a base hit by Taylor going into the corner. Alvarez is in. Bader is in. Nemo getting waved around toward the plate. The throw to the plate is not in time. A three-run double to right for Tyrone Taylor. On WCBS, the Mets won 6 to nothing. What a free agent signing Manaya has been. His last two starts, he's pitched 14 scoreless innings, allowing only eight hits with one walk. 21 strikeouts. Yankees were off home tonight for the Angels. Yanks tied for first with Baltimore. Red Sox 18 hits, won 9-5 at Kansas City. The Giants got to 500 with a 4-1 win in Washington. Then there are the White Sox, a model of consistency. They just keep losing 5-1 to one in Oakland the 32nd time this season Chicago has failed to score even two runs in a game losing streak is at 21 going back to July 10th it's tied for the longest skid in modern American League history the major league record is 23 two gold medals for the U.S. gives them 21 tied with China U.S. way ahead in overall medals won Valerie Allman won the women's discus just as she did three years ago and Caroline Marks won gold in the surfing that's taking place in Tahiti in Paris today. It's the U.S. and Brazil men's basketball quarterfinals. U.S. takes on Germany in the women's soccer semis. The men's soccer gold medal game will be Friday. Spain against France. Host nation won its semifinal game with Egypt in extra time. Super Bowl champion Chiefs have locked up an all-pro Kicker Harrison Butker will make six and a half million a year. Butker this past spring made news with a controversial commencement speech. John Stashauer, Bloomberg Sports, Karen Nathan. Coast to coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. It's a better morning. Some calm may be settling back into the market after yesterday's plunge for stocks around the world. A whole host of factors came together to send investors fleeing to safety. This morning, we are seeing a bit of recovery, but is this a calm before another storm? Joining us now, Janet Mui, head of market analysis at RBC Bruin Dolphin. Janet, good morning. Is the worst over? Hi, good morning, Nathan. Thanks for having me. Well, it, it is hard to say, to be honest. I think the market narrative has shifted from the focus on inflation to concern on growth. So unless we have the clarity on the growth side of things, I don't think we can be sure of you know, when is this end of volatility? Uh, Basically, we still have geopolitical tension and, of course, the U.S. election, where the race is pretty tight at the moment. Though, uh, having said that, we do feel that valuations have become more attractive. So um, certainly uh, uh, paving the way for a better entry point for investors. More attractive valuations where specifically? Where are you advising clients to buy in at this point? Yeah, so um, currently we are not, you know, exactly advising clients to buy in at this particular point. But overall, our portfolio strategy has been uh, overweight in U.S. and also we favor semiconductor stocks. Now, those areas of the market has obviously seen, uh, you know, a correction, and particularly some of those semiconductor stocks have slumped. I think, irrespective of fundamentals, it's more sentiment and position driven. So we feel that that could open up opportunities uh, because we still view those sectors as, uh, you know, uh, very good long term prospects. Are you looking for the market to test further lows? Uh, What other catalysts should we be looking at in terms of where this volatility could go from here? I think, you know, there is a real possibility. So our base case is still a soft landing, even though that recession risk admittedly has risen. I think the key risk here is, I think, is oil prices. We have seen actually oil prices falling because of those recession risks. But don't forget, we still have geopolitical risks on the background. The tension between Israel and Iran is still high. So if oil prices rise from here, that could be a pretty bad scenario for markets because that would mean stagflation. Does your soft landing thesis rely on the Fed delivering more aggressive rate cuts than it's been telegraphing? I think, yes, at this stage it does. So I think um, if the Fed were to cut a couple of times uh, this year and more next year, I think we are we have the pathway to avoid our recession. So yes, it is conditional on, on the Fed cutting. And the fact is, we, I think the thing is, the Fed does have the leeway to cut. I think that's pretty clear because first of all, the rates are at 5.5% and inflation is heading in the right direction. I think those 
but other very important assumption. If inflation reaccelerates, which is not what we're expecting, by the way, I think that will be more difficult backdrop. Does the Fed need to cut before September? I know a number of Fed officials have been uh, pushing back at that idea, but is that something that the Fed needs to consider? I think it could be a risky move, actually. I think so far, as you mentioned at the beginning, we are actually having a bit of a normality. And I think it's a bit it's a bit of a bad signaling if they were to cut in between meetings. It, it shows a bit of a desperation in, in my view. And I think, you know, we have just... You just, we just need to wait one month's time. I think nothing major is likely to happen in between. We are likely to get some more economic data uh, that, that could induce some volatility, but I think it's worthwhile to wait until September 18th. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.